Chapter Two of Grace Harlowe Overseas by Jessie Graham Flower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ashley Jane. Chapter Two. J. L. Frieda solves the mystery. The idea that any girl could be unhappy with such a home as this observed Elfreda, pausing to look back at Haven Home, a rambling structure that stood dazzling white against the magnificent trees that surrounded it, its high pillared verandas lending a dignity to the structure that was undeniable. I am happy, Elfreda, answered Grace. Then give me unhappiness. If yours is the true happiness of married life, I most emphatically prefer single blessedness. Come over here and sit down you and i are about to have a thorough understanding as your lawyer and as your best friend i am entitled to know everything elfreda led her friend to a settee under a spreading elm and still with an arm linked in one of grace's sat down beside her how long has this state of affairs existed at haven home i i don't know what you mean stammered grace oh yes you do you know that I know you and Tom are about as near to estrangement as a married couple well can be and still live together. Grace Hollow, it is my opinion that your own little head is all twisted, that you are doing Tom Gray a very great wrong. Now what is there about Tom's going to war? I... I don't know. Please, Elfreda, do not question me. You think he doesn't wish to go? demanded the lawyer shrewdly. "'Tell me the truth. Is that it?' Grace made no reply. "'I thought so. Why do you think he doesn't wish to go? You think he is afraid to go?' Grace bristled. She was indignant, and Elfreda chuckled to herself when her friend reproached her and defended Tom Gray in a flood of words, fighting hard to keep back the tears. "'Have you ever talked it over with Tom?' asked Elfreda. Grace shook her head. "'I thought not.' That is the way most domestic disturbances occur, as I have learned from my experience at the bar. Each side gets an idea into its head. Then the two drift uneasily apart. Grace Harlow, I gave you credit for possessing more sense. However, never having been in love, perhaps I do not understand what its reaction is. I will confess that I did wonder that Tom had not gone into the service, but I presumed then, as I do now, that he believes he has a good reason. Believe me, Grace, Tom will do his duty in good time. He cannot. He has taken on this forestry contract that will take him two years, perhaps three years, to complete. It is that that he has gone to Boston to arrange for. Then I demand that upon his return you and Tom get together and have a thorough heart house cleaning. Tell him how you feel on the subject as well as what your disappointment is at his attitude in this matter. Personally, I can't understand why any young woman, especially a bride, should be unhappy because her lovey-dovey doesn't run off to war and get himself killed, declared Elfreda, with an emphasis that made her friend wince. Don't, oh, don't, begged Grace. You, you do not understand. No, I will confess that I do not. Have you thought about the Overton commencement next week, to change the subject? No, truly I had not, replied Grace, brightening a little. Then let's think about it. Why not go up there for the great event, you and I? It will do you good, and when you come back your troubles will have faded like a morning mist over the meadows of Haven Home. Grace said she could not go without first asking her husband, whereupon J. Elfreda launched into an argument for the rights of her sex and the personal independence to which the sex was entitled, married or single. After luncheon the two friends went out for a long drive. Grace's skill at the wheel was well known to her friends, and though a fast driver, she drove with her head as well as her hands. Not only was she an excellent driver, but she could change a tyre or make temporary repairs with the skill of a born mechanic so that her friends never felt the slightest nervousness in going out with her. Rough roads, steep mountain grades or congested traffic had no terrors for her nor for her passengers. Grace benefited materially from the wholesome, practical association with her friend. 
This and the drive did wonders for her, and she returned with eyes sparkling, a smile on her lips, once more the Grace Harlowe that Elfreda had known in the Overton College days. A letter from Tom told Grace that he was obliged to make a trip into the main woods, which would delay his return until the latter part of the week. Of this Elfreda was secretly glad, for unknown to Grace she had sent a long night letter telegram to Tom, telling him what the situation was at Havenhome, and advising him to take his wife more fully into his confidence, either by letter or by word of mouth, upon his return. Elfreda told him frankly that his present attitude was alienating the affection of Grace, who was a patriot first and a wife next. There, she reflected, after the message was written and dispatched. I suppose I shall be set down as an old meddler, but Tom must remember that I am a lawyer and that it is my legitimate right to interfere in other people's domestic affairs. On the following day, Grace received another letter from her husband, couched in a tone of tenderness, and with a certain something between the lines that went straight to the heart of the young wife. What that something was she could not define, but it was there, and it brought a certain amount of solace to her troubled heart. Yet the spectre of doubt persisted in creeping into her consciousness. She had written Tom of her wish to go to the commencement at Overton, and in due time had his hearty approval of the plan, but urging her, for reasons which he would explain, to wait until his return before she started for Overton. All this was of the greatest possible interest to J. Elfreda, though she had not the slightest idea as to whether or not her message to Tom had borne fruit. At any rate, he would return with no doubts in his mind as to the situation at Havenhome, and with a full knowledge of what might follow his persisting in his policy of aloofness and failure to be at least frank with his bride. In the meantime, Miss Briggs went ahead with her plans for the visit to Overton to attend the commencement. She wrote to Miriam, Nora, Jessica and Emma Dean, urging them to join the party at Overton for a reunion that might never be possible again. Emma Dean did not reply. The others did, promising to meet Grace and Elfreda on the day before commencement. After receiving these acceptances, J. Elfreda acquainted Grace with what she had done. I am beginning to wonder whether I am the mistress of my own home or even of myself, replied Grace smilingly. You are neither, but you are going to be both, returned Elfreda bluntly. You go ahead and be yourself and I'll settle any difficulties that may follow your having taken the law into your own hands. You know I am the law, and I have simply assigned the law to you for present purposes. I shall write to Mrs. Elwood today, telling her that we are coming and that some of us will wish to stay with her. You, of course, will prefer to go to the Harlow House, and I rather think I shall go there too. Yes, I'll write to the Harlow House at the same time. This Elfreda did. Now all that remains is for the lord and master of this house behind the world to return and give his final august consent to us two children going away for a holiday. And suppose he should not, suggested Grace. Should not, demanded Miss Briggs, elevating her eyebrows. I should like to see any mere man step in and interfere with the plans of J. Elfreda Briggs, was the reply uttered with emphasis. My plans are your plans in this instance, so we go to Overton. If Tom does not return by Friday, I shall not leave until he does, announced Grace with finality. Of course we may have to wait a day or two, replied Elfreda, having in mind the message she had sent to Tom Gray and the letter he had written to Grace. However, we shall go just the same. I shall wire him today to be certain to return in time. Grace sighed a sigh of resignation. There was no stopping J. Elfreda when once she was well started on any definite line of action. As for J. Elfreda herself, she was saying to herself, Elfreda Briggs, you are playing a desperate game with the happiness of two human beings in the balance. If you stub your toe, you are lost and so are they. Thursday found preparations for the journey completed, but with no word from Tom Gray saying when he expected to return home. Grace was restless, and her face was resuming the set look it had worn at the time of her friend's arrival. She was looking forward to going back to Overton, 
and if at this late hour she found it impossible to do so, her disappointment would be keen. Elfrida herself was a little out of humour as the day drew on with still no word from Grace's husband, and she found herself undecided as to what course she would follow provided Tom did not return in time to permit them to carry out their plans. I will cross that bridge when I get to it, was Elfrida's conclusion, but as she made it, a carriage crunched on the gravel drive and the cheery voice of Tom Gray called, Hello! He had driven up in the old antiquated hack that did service for the passengers who detrained at the station in Oakdale. Grace and Elfrida hurried out, Grace remaining at the head of the steps, Elfrida stepping down and shaking hands with Tom. It is fortunate for you, young man, that you returned in time. Two women were beginning to prepare to give you a warm reception if you came too late to permit them to carry out their well-laid plans for an old-time college romp. Thank you for the message, said Tom under his breath. Then running up the steps he gave Grace what Elfrida characterized to herself as a most perfunctory kiss. I returned as soon as I could, apologized Tom. I had much to do and I have much to say to you. First I must run up and have a bath and a change of clothing. No, no, I'll carry the bundle, he added, flushing as Grace sought to take the bulky package done up in rough brown paper. Wait for me in the living room. I shall be down in a few moments. After he had run lightly upstairs, the two girls entered the living room and sat down to await Tom's return. Grace had sensed the perfunctoriness of her husband's kiss, but there was something about him that puzzled her more than ever. Somehow it seemed to her that it was a new Tom who had returned to her. There was a purpose and resolution in his eyes that was like the old Tom she had known before the barrier rose up between them. Something is coming off in this house, or I am much mistaken in my reading of the signs, reflected Elfrida. A few moments later they heard him clattering down the stairs. It was not the accustomed firm tread of Tom Gray, but a sound that reminded Grace's friend of hobnailed shoes. And then he appeared before them. Elfrida saw Grace's face go deathly pale, then a slow flush rise to her cheeks, and Elfrida herself uttered a little gasp at what she saw framed there in the doorway. Tom, very erect, his eyes alight, a half-smile on his face, stood regarding Grace, who had risen to her feet, the colour flooding her face and neck. Tom was in the uniform of a private of the United States Army. "'Tom! Oh, Tom!' cried Grace, opening wide her arms. "'This is no place for a bachelor girl,' exclaimed J. Elfrida, and fled. End of chapter 2 Recording by Ashley Jane